product rule. Moving on in our study of derivatives, the next lesson for us to learn is the rule called the product rule. This rule is going to come in handy every time we form a new function, let's call it h of x, which is the product of two other functions, so h of x is equal to f of x times g of x. Usually this dot won't be there, but in the beginning I put this dot here to mean that it's the product. This function times that function is the function h of x which we wish to derive. Okay, so what's the derivative of h of x? Well, first of all, let me tell you what it's not. The derivative of h of x is not the derivative of f of x times the derivative of g of x. Okay, so it is not the product of each individual derivative. What the derivative of h of x is equal to is actually the derivative of f of x times g of x without taking its derivative. Then we're going to add the derivative of g of x times f of x without taking its derivative. Okay, so let's look at this again. I've written in both forms. Um, in this form, the d dx is the same thing as the prime here. It denotes the derivative. So the d dx of h of x is df dx times g. See, we left this one alone. Then we added the dg dx, so we took g's derivative, and then we left f of x alone. Okay, so oftentimes people will say this is called the first function, and that's the second function, and they'll say the derivative of the product of a first and second function, derivative of the first plus the sec times the second, plus the derivative of the second times the first. Okay, so I'm not going to derive this um, rule, but I'll tell you that you can see a proof or derivation of this rule using the limit definition of the derivative. Um, let me go right into an example where I can show you what the derivative of a product is and contrast that with what it is not, which is a common mistake. Let's form a function h of x as a product of two simple linear functions, x plus 1 times x minus 1. Okay, so I'm going to call this one right here my first function, f of x, and I've multiplied that by this one right here, which I call my second function, g of x. Okay, so firstly, like what I said before, the derivative of a product is not the product of the each derivative. So it's not the product of the derivatives, and I'd just like to show you why that's true right now, um, because I chose this function to be as simple as possible, because actually, without even using the product rule, I could get the derivative using the power rule with the sum and difference rule by saying that this is equal to, in factored form, x squared plus minus 1, right? So if I wanted to, I could just say, oh, well, according to the power rule, the h prime of x here is going to be the derivative 2x, right? So I know that the answer is 2x, but I want to show you conceptually what the most common mistake is, is that if you see two functions multiplied together, you may be tempted to take the derivative of each function and then multiply those together. That's what I'm calling the product of the derivatives. And I just want to show you that h prime, look if I thought that was, is it going to be, let's say, the derivative of f times the derivative of g? Um, let's see, what's the derivative of the function x plus 1? What's the derivative of f of x? It's just 1, right? Because that's the derivative of that term right here. And then what's the derivative of g of x? That's also 1, because that's the slope on the slope function, the coefficient of 1 from the x there. And that's 1 times 1, and that's 1. But we know the answer is not 1, because if we actually FOIL this out and then just use the power rule, we can see the answer is actually 2x, okay? So, no. It's not that. So don't take the derivative of each function in the product and then just multiply those two things together. Do not do that. Okay, so let's just use the rule, use the product rule. And we're going to say that the derivative of h of x is equal to the derivative of f of x, which we discussed as 1, we're going to take that and multiply it by g of x, leaving the function g of x completely alone. Then we're going to add the derivative of g of x, which is also 1, multiply that by the f of x, leaving that totally alone. And now when you use this type of rule, oftentimes you'll want to simplify afterwards because you're going to have a lot of common terms. Here, if we FOIL this out, we get x minus 1. Then we get a plus x plus 1. We got some common terms there, those cancel out, and these two x's add together, and we get 2x, and that's exactly what we thought it was by going the other route up here. 
Keep in mind that as you learn more and more derivative rules, there may be actually more than one way to take the derivative, and actually we could have even gone back to the limit definition of the derivative and derived this fact that way. Okay, so there's more than one right way to get to the answer, but there's always going to be just that one right answer. That's the best situation for you as a student, I think, because that means that you can check your work possibly by going by two different routes. Okay, well that function was pretty easy. Um, why don't we move on to start to talk about a reason why we need to know this. So, let's see, our applications are those to business, right? Let's try to think of some function in business where we encounter a product. How about this application? Total revenue. Okay, so let's say I'm charging a certain price for my item, right? How much total money am I going to make if I've sold X items? It's going to be the price per item multiplied by the number of items, right? So the total revenue, as we saw in pre-calculus, is going to be price times number of items. So here X is the number of items, R of X is the amount of total revenue. And let's say that we have a price, but it's not fixed. Maybe we have a sliding scale for a price, so if you buy more of it, I will charge you less per item. That means our price would not be fixed, our price would be variable and dependent on the number of items sold. So here you can see a classic business product where we have total revenue being the product of a pricing function, p of x, multiplied by the simple linear function here, the g of x just equal to x. Okay? Um, let's go a little further into pretend land and say, I don't know, maybe if you buy one item, I'll charge you $99. If you buy two, I'll charge you $98. If you buy three items, I'll charge you $97. So you see what I'm saying? This could be a sliding scale. In this case, for my example, my price that I'm going to charge you per item is the function 100 minus x. Okay? So you can see that if I buy just one, I'm going to cost $99 per item. If I buy two, it'll cost $98 per item. And my total revenue will be $98 per item times the two items that I sold. And that's, uh, um, you know, that will be total amount. <clears throat> okay, let's take this derivative in two ways to check our work because that will be handy to have in our toolbox in case somebody asks us, what's r prime of x? Why don't you calculate this in two different ways? Here, I want you to use factoring as I did on the board up there. First, I factored it out into a polynomial and then I used the power rule. And then also use the product rule that we just learned. <coughs> okay, and the product rule again is that h of x prime is going to be f prime of x times g of x plus g prime of x times f of x. Alright, I want you to do exactly as I did over there um, and you should get the same answer on top and bottom here. Okay, I hope you're playing along because that's the best way to see what level you're at right now. Okay, so the first way was to factor this through. It's also equal to the polynomial 100x minus x squared. And then by just the power, constant multiple, sum and difference rules, the derivative is 100 coming down from the 100x, and then minus 2x coming from the minus x squared. Right? Now what if we use this other route, and here I'm going to put on top of these each one of the terms. The f, let's call this part right here, let's call this one the f of x, and then we'll call this one right here the g. Here g of x will be just the simple function x. f prime of x, what's the derivative of this function with respect to x? Minus 1, that's right, it's the coefficient of the linear term there, the minus 1 that's right there. Then we're going to multiply by g of x and we're going to leave it alone. What's the derivative of g of x? That's just 1, right. And then we're going to leave the f of x alone. And then if you combine like terms, I won't put that on the board, but if you combine like terms, you should be able to show we have 1 minus x, then we have another minus x, so we have minus 2x, and we have a plus 100, and that's the same 100 we see there. All right, that's perfect. Can you keep in mind what the r prime means? Let me give you some units just for you to think about this problem. Let's say that our r of x here was in dollars, and let's say our x was in number of items. <clears throat> what would the units on the derivative r prime of x be if r was in dollars and x was in number of items? 
This would be 100 minus 2x, what? Dollars per item. That's right. Okay, so if I increase my item by 1, this is how much my total revenue is expected to change. Okay, and keep in mind that the concept in business of what happens to your total function if you increase your input variable just by one item more, that's called a marginal quantity, right? So this is an approximation for the marginal revenue in terms of business. Okay, um, so in both these cases so far, you really could have gone two routes. So now I'm going to give you an example of kind of a, a nastier function. I'm not really sure where I might get this function, but maybe through some complex mathematical modeling, I've derived that I need to understand this product. Let's say f of x is equal to, I don't know, 7x squared plus 5x cubed minus 1 times x to the 4 plus 2x, 2 plus x. All right, so now I've got two quite large polynomials getting multiplied together here, and technically I could still go two routes with this derivative problem. If I want to take the derivative, I could factor through all of this stuff, but see there's three terms in each one, so it's more complicated than your usual two-term foiling. And then I could take the derivative of this polynomial using the old rules, but now I'm not so into it because like there's so many things to foil out, I don't want to do that. Okay, um, so, oh, sorry, I don't want to confuse you. I'll call this product h of x. So let's take the derivative just using the product rule. And in this case, I won't ask you to simplify it. I'll just ask you to leave it unsimplified. And I just want to see and make sure that you can enact this rule right here. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and definitely want to try that out for yourself. Don't just watch me. Um, see if you can do this according to that rule, okay? All right, I hope you tried. Um, so let's see. As usual, I will call this first one f, and I will call the second one g, and then I'm just going to follow along with the rule, okay? So if it asks me for what's the derivative of h prime of x, I'm going to say what's the derivative of f? That's going to be what I put right here. Well, let's see. 7 comes down, so x6 like that. Then 5 times 3 is 15, so and then we get the x to the 2. And then what happened to the minus 1? The derivative of any constant number is 0, and so that's why the minus 1 just went away. Okay, so that's f prime, and then I'm going to write g right here. All right, and you notice I didn't do anything to g, leave g alone. Then I'm going to add to that, taking the derivative of g, which comes out like this. Okay, make sure you understand that term by term. I'm using the power rule combined with the constant multiple and sum and difference rules. And then I'm just going to copy down f without taking its derivative. Notice that I am not taking the derivative of both of them at the same time. I do one, leave the other alone. Then I add, do the other, leave that one alone. It doesn't actually even have to be in this order. Check this out. I could go like this to the rule and it would still be the same rule, right? Because you can add 3 plus 7 and 7 plus 3, so it doesn't really matter what order you do them in. It just matters that you remember, you take the derivative of one, leave the other alone. Then you add the derivative of the other one, and you leave the first one alone, okay? And that was what we would call the unsimplified form. And if someone asked you for the simplified form, then you'd have to factor all that stuff through and combine like terms. And actually, if you needed the simplified form of this derivative, it might be faster to factor all this stuff through. See, because we already have to do that mess down here. And then just use the um, power rule combined with the other simple rules. Okay, so either way, slice it. That's going to be the derivative of h prime. And let's just remember theoretically what the derivative means. Like, for example, what if somebody asked me, what's the slope of the tangent line to h of x when x is equal to 0? What if somebody asked me that question? Am I going to get a function for my answer or am I going to get a number for my answer? What's the slope of the tangent line? If anybody ever asks you for the actual slope of a line, that's going to be a number. It's going to be a number that multiplies the linear term x. Okay, so I should expect a number out of this. And how do I get that number? 
the slope of a tangent line to a function is equal to the derivative of that function evaluated at the requested x point. Right. So then I would just say, okay, what's h prime when I evaluate x at 0? Now I chose 0 because that's the easiest number for me to do in my head here. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So the whole thing on that first product turns out to be 0 times 0. 0, 0, 1. So that one turned into a 1. 0, 0, minus 1. That's a minus 1. So that's a minus 1. That's actually a numerical value. If somebody asked me for the slope of a tangent line, that's going to be the numerical value minus 1. And this is also the same thing as someone asking me for the instantaneous rate of change. Okay, so if someone said, what's the instantaneous rate of change of the function h of x at the value of x equals 0, that would also be minus 1. Maybe someone's going to ask you this way, maybe that way, maybe they'll ask you for both, and that would just be to check your understanding that those are both equal to the same numerical value right there. Okay, great. Um, I hope you guys are feeling comfortable with this. Definitely want to practice in any homework that you have.